Good evening, and thanks for joining the Oxford Our Body event for Pinter Science 2021. I hope you've been able to enjoy some of the other great talks this week and are looking forward to what's to come over the next hour. This event focuses on the essential elements of life, starting with the importance of iron in the immune response and protection against viruses, and then moving to the crucial role that love plays in all of our lives. We are keen to know where in the world you are listening from this evening. So please interact with us in the chat and post on social media at Pint of Science, hashtag Pint21. Please also post any questions that you have for the speakers. We'll have some time to, time to ask these after each talk. The first speaker of this evening is Professor Hal Drakesmith. Hal is Professor of Iron Biology at the MRC Wetherill Institute of Molecular Medicine at the University of Oxford. He was trained at the University of Cambridge, University of Kyoto and University College London before moving to Oxford. His lab works on the role of iron in anemia, infectious diseases and immune responses to vaccines. We are very grateful that you were able to join us this evening, Hal, and are really looking forward to your talk. So please take it away. Well, thanks very much. Thanks, Lucy. And hello, everybody. Hope everybody's doing OK. So um, I'm going to be talking about a few different uh, molecules and a few different types of cell. Um, this molecule here, I hope you can see, is the key one is a hormone you might not have heard of before that we have called hepcidin. These are lymphocytes, which help defend the body against infection. This is a protein called transferrin, which by the name, as you can probably tell, transports iron around the body. And this, unfortunately, you may well recognize is SARS-CoV-2. Okay, so I'm going to cover a few themes. I'm going to start off with a couple of, of, of anecdotes, including um, the first one, which is a, a little bit of a sad story, but um, extremely illustrative. So uh, Malcolm Kasadaban was an associate professor of microbiology in Chicago University. Uh, and as he was approaching retirement in the uh, early 2000s, unfortunately became uh, very ill and he was admitted to intensive care in hospital in Chicago and he had sepsis, a form of an, an infection. And unfortunately, despite the, the best efforts of the attending physicians, he, he, they were unable to, to save him. And they then began investigating what potentially could have been the cause of death and became rather worried when they realized that he'd been working in the lab on Yersinia pestis, the causative agent of bubonic plague, the Black Death. And so um, although he had been working on a, a version of Yersinia pestis, which was thought to be a very safe strain that had never caused any trouble in, uh, in any other researchers for decades because it has a, a whole chunk of its DNA deleted to make it very poor at growing, they did know that other people in the same institute were working on the real nasty wild version of Yersinia pestis. So there was quarantine, there was uh, red tape, uh, red tape everywhere, everybody was um, tested and there was a, a worry that there'd been a plague outbreak in Chicago. But it turned out that this wasn't the case. And when they investigated the particular organism that had been responsible for, her, for Professor Kasadaban's death, it turned out that it was this safe strain. And they couldn't understand the physicians why this extremely safe strain, very bad at growing, a lot of its DNA deleted, could possibly have caused his death. And then eventually some very clever physicians just realized that uh, the professor had a undiagnosed form of an iron overloading disease, too much iron in the body, called hemochromatosis. This is a, a section of tissue stained with a, a dye that stains uh, too much the excess iron blue. And it turns out that the, the safe, the reason why this particular version of Yersinia pestis was safe is because the genes that had been deleted, the genes that enable the organism to be very, very good at scavenging iron from their host that they infect. And these bugs really need iron to grow. And without these genes, they normally can't get it. But in the person who has too much iron, iron overload, it didn't matter. So this meant that the genetic defect in the bug was complemented by uh, the, uh, the, the disorder that Professor Kasadaban have, has, showing that iron could really tip the balance in the outcome of, of an infection. That's too much iron, but you'll probably be more familiar with the idea that not enough iron is, is, a, is a bad thing too. So particularly it can cause anemia. And recent estimates uh, think that about well over a billion people suffer from iron deficiency anemia. 
and it's common in um, premenopausal women and in infants and, and to some extent in the elderly as well. And it turns out that in sub-Saharan Africa and in many South Asian countries, this iron deficiency anemia is in fact the, one of the leading causes, if not the leading cause, of morbidity of years lived with disability in the population at large. So it's a very serious health problem. And it affects uh, fetal growth and particularly um, iron deficiency in infancy can affect growth and development. Um, and it's a, it's a serious problem. The WHO uh, know all about it, of course, there's, there's um, great big guides to how to deal with it. And a key thing here is that the planet, planet Earth, is full of iron. There's an enormous amount of iron there. It's very easy to make iron tablets. Iron tablets are very cheap. Um, there are lots of different formulations available. So what's the big problem? Why can't we make iron deficiency anemia better simply by providing extra iron in the diet and iron tablets and so on? And the answer to this really uh, is illustrated by a, uh, a another slightly sad story that occurred on Pemba Island off the east coast of Tanzania, where there's a lot of anemia. And the idea was to give iron to 24, to do a trial of 24,000 young infants, giving them either iron or iron and folic acid and zinc um, uh, or placebo, the idea that extra iron would combat anemia, improve growth, uh, and basically lead to better development of, of, of those infants who were given iron. And this trial, the PEMBA trial, um, had to be stopped after 11 months because of an increased incidence of death and hospitalization in those groups of children who were being given iron or iron and folic acid. And particularly it was malaria, but other infections as well were, were increased in this group of children who were, who were being given extra iron. So a couple of things from this, it's kind of a classic own goal, trying to make things better, but in fact, through perhaps not understanding the problem well enough, making it worse, and really demonstrating that combating anemia is a very serious and difficult problem and, and not so simple to get around. So we come to the important questions of why, you know, why is iron so critical during infections? How can it tip the balance one way or the other? What controls the amount of iron that we, that, that we have in humans? And then you know, does iron influence other aspects that are important with regard to infection, in particular at the moment, very important um, vaccines and response to vaccines. And for these latter two, we'll be, I'll be talking a lot about this hormone hepcidin, which we'll, we'll come to. Okay, but for number one, we have to go all the way back uh, to get a perspective on this, to the origin of life. Uh, potentially about four billion years ago, of course, nobody knows exactly when, um, but it turns out iron was probably pretty important right from the get-go. <clears throat> and a major reason for this is that in the absence of oxygen, because four billion years ago there was almost no oxygen around, iron is soluble, soluble in water. It's, you know, it's, it's like sodium chloride, very soluble in, in water and in the absence of, uh, of oxygen. And because it's abundant as well, this means it was very available, very easy to get a hold of, and we call that bioavailable. And when you combine that with the, uh, the biochemical properties of iron, that it's able to shuttle electrons very easily, it can uh, gain and lose an electron, it can catalyze chemical reactions uh, very well, and it can also bond with other elements in many orientations. So here is iron in a cluster of iron and sulfur, and here is iron is in heme, uh, as heme of hemoglobin. And so it can adopt many different conformations. It's biochemically almost unique in what it can do, and it's around a lot, very soluble. And so the idea is that iron was really central to the development of early biochemistry at the beginning of life. Uh, and it's thought that iron facilitated the development of biochemical processes that evolved from any way ongoing geochemical reactions. Of course, this is uh, hypothetical to some extent, but there's a lot of experimental evidence to, to support it. And so major metabolic activities that are conserved throughout different types of life happen in all different types of organisms often need iron. So in order to incorporate elements in the environment into cells, so carbon dioxide requires something called acetyl-CoA pathway, or bringing nitrogen in, um, nitrogenases, using hydrogen and making energy from using hydrogen enzymes called hydrogenases, they all need iron to work. Iron is in the catalytic center. Making DNA um, requires, the, the final step is an enzyme called ribonucleotide reductase, 
also uses iron, very highly conserved throughout life. And so it turns out iron really underpins cellular metabolism and physiology in general. So transporting oxygen in the blood, the Krebs cycle or TCA cycle, which um, makes energy and, and uh, makes uh, lots of different types of molecules in cells. Mitochondria that, that make energy from oxygen need an enormous amount of iron. Uh, DNA synthesis and also repairing DNA, uh, the, the enzymes that mediate this also need iron. So um, all, iron really important, but of course, when iron is available and it's soluble and there isn't any oxygen, that's fine. And this is the situation was called a ferrous paradise where it's easy to get the iron that you need. But then things changed. So oxygen came along, perhaps uh, mostly through photosynthesis, the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere. And when iron is oxidized, it's insoluble, it's rust. It precipitates out of water, it goes to the bottom of the sea. And so it's now abundant, but no longer available to life, at least no longer as available, uh, much, much more difficult to get hold of. And you can see in, in rocks, in banded iron formations, the evidence of this, uh, where the, these, these lines of rust all in rocks all over the planet as iron precipitated out of the sea and, in, and into, um, into geology. So the, the key nutrient that all life fundamentally needs for metabolism and growth was relatively abruptly extremely scarce, so a, a big selection pressure, a big stress on, on the biosphere. So this is why we have a battle for iron. Life is addicted to iron. We, we can't get away from it. There are only two iron independent organisms that we know of, but we still need it. Iron cannot be synthesized. It's not like sugar or a fatty acid or, or a protein. You know, it's only made in stars. Cells can't make it. So when there is an infection, infection is essentially thief of, uh, um, thievery of, of, of nutrients. The bacteria, the parasites are trying to acquire your, the nutritional resources from the, the host, the person they infect. It turns out that iron acquisition is really key to this. Iron is a critical virulence factor explaining both the Pember trial and the, uh, the Professor Kasadaban's experience. So the amount of iron in the host, in the person who's being infected, influences the outcome of infection. And uh, as, as a host, we need to defend our iron against infections. So how do we do that? What controls the amount of iron in humans? And it turns out it's a molecule called hepcidin, which is uh, the master iron regulatory hormone. And this both controls the amount of iron in us, so keeps us in iron balance, not too much or too little, usually. And it also controls the distribution of iron between um, between serum and and cells, as I'll come on to. And you can make an analogy with insulin. So you, everybody will have heard of insulin. And if you have a, a load of sugar, a Mars bar, then that's sensed um, in the pancreas. The pancreas makes insulin, and the action of insulin is then to return the system to glucose homeostasis. It decreases um, glucose. The molecular mechanisms by which hepcidin work are completely different, but conceptually, by analogy, it's kind of about the same thing. High iron is sensed by the liver, the liver makes hepcidin, and hepcidin acts to decrease iron. Insulin was discovered in 1922, but we only really figured out how hepcidin worked since about 2004, 2005. But it, hepcidin is at least as important to iron as insulin is to glucose. A bit more information on how it works. So we absorb about a milligram of iron per day from our diet, where it's loaded onto a dedicated protein called transferrin, which ferries it around the circulation, the bloodstream, and delivers it to where it's needed. Most of it goes to the bone marrow, where the iron ends up in the heme of hemoglobin in red cells. But other cells need it too, and I'll come on to the immune system in particular later. Red cells contain most of the iron in the body, and they have a finite life in humans. Each red cell lives for about 120 days. At the end of that, uh, uh, cells called macrophages uh, eat the old red blood cells, crunch them up, and recycle the iron back into the circulation. And about 25 times as much iron is recycled per day as is absorbed from the diet. What, what, um, what governs this process uh, are basically an interaction between two proteins. So there's only one known protein which enables cells to kick iron out of them and into the circulation. It's called ferroportin. And ferroportin um, controls the output of iron from the gut into plasma and the output of iron from macrophages into plasma. And hepcidin binds to ferroportin and stops it. So you can see immediately that the more hepcidin you have, the less iron you'll absorb from the diet 
and the more iron will be locked up in these cells and not in the plasma and not available for incorporation into these cells. And when we have an infection, what happens is exactly that. Hepcidin is increased. So that's showing this here. Now we have the idea that iron is being recycled from red cells through macrophages and onto transferrin, or being absorbed from the diet and loaded onto transferrin through ferroportin. If an individual is infected, that is sensed um, by the immune system, and the immediate one of the immediate innate responses of the immune system is to make hepcidin, to increase hepcidin. And hepcidin then binds to ferroportin, stops it working, and you end up with very little iron in your bloodstream. And, and this is the, 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 the effect of hepcidin during an infection. And this can be extremely protective. And this is best illustrated by thinking about a particular infection called Vibrio, a pathogen called Vibrio vulnificus, which is um, a, a called gram-negative siderophilic, means it loves iron, bacterium. Uh, it lives in oysters, and it's, in fact, the leading cause of seafood-related deaths in the States. Um, but mostly, it, it very it very rarely actually causes harm. Only sometimes is it, does it um, does it cause harm, and it's usually safe, and usually the, the body can defend uh, itself against it. And in this experiment, I think this this is really clear experiment of demonstrating the importance of hepcidin and iron for an infection. So these are normal mice. Um, in, injected with either a thousand or a hundred thousand Vibrio bacteria, and they almost all survive that up to four days. Uh, only one of them, one of the mice that had a higher dose of bacteria, was not able to survive the infection. But instead of injecting the bacteria into into normal mice, we uh, the, our collaborators they injected um, bacteria into mice that did not have hepcidin, so hepcidin knockout mice, and all of those mice died within half a day. So it shows it be an absolutely enormous um, effect of, of iron on particular infections, not on all, um, but on this particular infection, very dramatic. So this is the low serum iron state then, and it's common during infections. It's also common during uh, chronic inflammatory disorders, and you get it through uh, just having not enough iron in the diet eventually as well. And we know that it can protect against bacteria and malaria, but other cells need iron too. And the immune system in particular is, is really hungry for iron. And um, so your lymphocytes, the T cells and the B cells that make antibodies, when they're activated, they change their metabolism and they really switch on their metabolism and get as active as they can. And to support that, they need a lot of iron. So um, this is called transferrin receptor and protein that mediates cells uh, acquiring iron. And they hugely upregulate transferrin receptor after they are activated from almost undetectable to a million copies of this protein per cell. At the same time, ferroportin, the, the molecule that, that, um, that pumps iron out of cells, is turned off. So they turn into massively iron acquiring uh, iron, iron, and iron holding cells, which helps their metabolism. So then if we take iron away, what then happens? to the immune response and we can do this in mice in, a, in fairly simply what we all we do is we inject a mouse with hepcidin with extra hepcidin and this um, stops iron coming into the bloodstream into the serum by blocking off ferroportin and that means the amount of iron in the bloodstream plummets goes right down to very low levels and what we do then is we take a mouse and we vaccinate it we immunize it and that in itself doesn't change the amount of iron in the serum and then just as the T cell and the B cell lymphocyte response is getting going, we then um, inject the mouse with, with hepcidin, which, which means that you get this hypophremic state and, a, and a, low, a low amount of iron in serum. And we can also alter the diet as well, but it turns out that doesn't matter. <clears throat> All that matters is keeping the iron down here and hepcidin is enough to do that. And when you do that, this is work done by Joe in the lab, you almost completely stop the immune response to the vaccine. So this each dot here is a cell that's trying to respond to the vaccine. And in the control in blue, there's a massive big cloud of them. And in the mice sort of, um, that have a low iron state, there's very, very few cells that are responding to the vaccine. And in, in here, this is the average of each dot is representing the response of, a, of, of an individual mouse. <coughs> you can see huge differences here. And, and it doesn't depend on the type of uh, vaccine that's been given. We've tried lots of different types. 
Uh, and it's not, and this is one particular flavor of, of lymphocyte called CD8 T cells, but it works for others, for CD4s, also the B cell response that make antibodies, and there's a lower antibody response as well if there's not enough iron in, in plasma. Uh, and so we can, if we, you can imagine this as, as following, normally when a, a bug is exposed to the immune system, it, uh, T cells, lymphocytes are presented to it, they activate, they switch on their transferrin receptor here in green, and they get hold of enough iron to support their proliferation and make an immune response. But if you inject a mouse with hepcidin, the iron disappears, the cells don't proliferate, uh, and the, you end up with a really poor immune response. And, and, that, and that's kind of essentially what we've shown. So in what situations could this really be important in humans? And one obviously is, you know, response to vaccines. And in particular, going back to sub-Saharan Africa and, and how common um, low serum iron hypofremia is in infants. Uh, and so uh, to, to illustrate that, this is the amount of iron in plasma uh, in infants as they, as they grow. When they're born, they have a, a lot of um, iron from their mum, but very rapidly, this amount of iron plummets to very, very low levels. This is male, female, higher birth weight, lower birth weight um, populations, and it's very, very low compared to the normal range in, in for instance, UK, USA, Finland um, uh, infants. So if these individuals are trying to respond to vaccines, it's going to be hard, but of course, this very low amount of serum iron does protect them against some other infections. Um, and so we've studied this uh, with collaborators. And in fact, the initial, the initial data does support this, that iron deficiency anemia at the time of vaccination predicts a decreased vaccine response. But if you give iron back, you can, you can actually increase the response to a vaccine. And this is a, an, ind an initial indication of this. And we're now doing a, a lot, some large clinical trials to really test if this is a case if we can improve vaccines. OK, and the, the, the other situation in which this might be important is, of course, in infections that cause chronic inflammation. And um, one of such infection is, of course, SARS-CoV-2. Well, we know that um, there's not very good T cell, B cell response in people who have severe disease. And they also have very severe chronic uh, inflammation that we know can switch on hepcidin and can decrease iron. And so we worked with ICU doctors, Akshay Shah in particular, to think about iron uh, in the context of SARS CoV 2 patients. And um, what Akshay was able to do was to show that. Patients, when they were admitted to ICU, so this is severe disease, had extremely low levels of serum iron. So well below the normal range and lower than we've almost ever seen in any other condition. And in fact, when you looked at those, the patients who had the most severe disease had the lowest iron. A small number of patients so far, um, but it's uh, uh, so far it's very clear. And as I'll come on to, other groups have, uh, have confirmed this. We also noticed that the, the patients with the lowest amount of iron also had the lowest number of lymphocytes that we could detect. Uh, again, correlating with what we'd shown earlier, that iron is needed for your T cells and your B cells to work. And is there any association then between low iron hypofremia in, in the plasma and patient outcome? And uh, we and others had shown that this, that, that this is the case, that if, if iron stays low, then it's, it's a predictor of um, bad outcome. And groups in Germany and in um, China and now also in Italy have, have basically confirmed this, that there's a, an association between disturbed iron metabolism and lung injury uh, and, uh, and death. And, um, uh, and uh, we're, we're carrying on now to investigate that in, in more depth. And as a, as a kind of an experiment to show that this could be the case, that low iron could actually cause, be a causative element and, and, and inhibit immunity, we did an experiment in mice with influenza virus, where we just gave the mice flu and then kept iron low and asked what happens. This was done by Jack Tam, again by injecting them with mini hepcidin. And we saw the same thing. Essentially, we, we could stop the the immune cell response to, to influenza virus. Again, fewer cells here in this cloud compared to in the control. There are fewer um, uh, B cell responses. And the antibodies, the neutralizing antibodies that are really important to block viral infection were just not being generated in the mice that had received flu and hepcidin. Um, 
the lung pathology was worse. This, this was uh, basically a, a, this lung no longer really looks like a lung in the, in the mice that had been given influenza virus and mini hepstein, a lot more inflammation and tissue damage. Uh, and um, maximum levels of, of inflammation uh, on the on the in the lung, and the mice didn't did, lost more weight. They were they were less well, and and uh, in fact more of them died. So a very kind of clear effect that, that changing iron itself really does influence the outcome of infection through through influencing immunity. So we can put all this together now in the last slide. Um, we know that inflammation increases hepcidin and hepcidin controls the amount of iron in plasma. So as you have, if the cause of the, of the inflammation is an infection by bacteria or malaria that really need iron to grow, this is beneficial. It really helps. But if the cause of the infection is a virus that doesn't need iron to grow in the same extent, then the problem is that this can be a risk to the host because in fact, low iron can inhibit the immune response to the virus. And that means the, response, the, the virus can uh, uh, go out of control, uh, it's not restricted, it persists, and then you end up with in a vicious circle of more inflammation, even lower iron, even poorer immune response, uh, and, and um, uh, an unfortunate um, circumstance. But it does also mean that there's a new therapeutic opportunity. You can kind of, one can imagine, and we're exploring ways in which we can tip the balance in the favor of the infected person in any situation by knowing, by understanding in greater depth the mechanism of how iron is important during infection. So to summarize, almost all life needs iron to grow and thrive. In an oxygenated world, iron is poorly bioavailable and iron deficiency is common. And so during infections, there is a real is a battle for iron. In humans, the amount of iron in our body is controlled by a hormone called hepcidin, and hepcidin decreases the amount of iron in blood plasma, and that protects us against some bacterial infections and, and malaria. But the immune system, T cells and B cells, really need iron too, and if there isn't enough iron, that can inhibit the immune response to vaccines and to viral infections. So um, that was it. Thank you very much. I'd just like to thank um, Joe Frost, who did most of the work for that, and our collaborators in Portugal, and Akshay and ICU, and other collaborators, and, and the, the funders who've really helped doing this work over a long period of time. So thank you. Thanks, Hal. That was very interesting. Um, we've got some questions coming through in the chat, so let's have a look at some of those. So from, um, I guess, Anthony Vestia, he wants to know, in B12 deficiency anemia, are extra doses of iron simply regulated by hepcidin until normal levels achieved, i.e. is excess secreted or is there a risk of toxic amounts being absorbed? A very good question. Yeah, we don't have a good way, humans do not have a good way of excreting iron or regulating excretion of iron. So the more iron you, uh, you you put in, then essentially it kind of stays in. So you have to be very careful about the amount of iron that's given. And if in tablets, um, often the amount of iron that's given is far too much and isn't being absorbed. And that can cause problems in the gut uh, and you end up with inflammation, constipation uh, and gastrointestinal issues. And, if, and there's a lot of work being done to, to, to suggest that Really, we should be taking iron tablets every other day rather than every day, and maybe the, the dose should be lower, and they should be being taken in the morning and not the afternoon. There's a lot of guidelines that are hopefully going to be revised around that to, to combat that problem. Thanks. Our next question is from Tim Priest, and he wants yep. to know, um, there is a well-known genetic disease, hemochromatosis. Oh, I can't say it. Hemochromatosis. Is this related to genetic changes in hepcidin? Absolutely it is, yes, so thanks. Yeah, and um, so the mutations that cause hemochromatosis influence the production of hepcidin. Uh, they either um, stop it being made or they actually, there are mutations in the gene itself and so it's, it's it, either a mutated version is made or a dysfunctional version is made. Or they are mutations in ferroportin, which means that hepcidin just doesn't work properly because it can't be inhibited. But absolutely right, it, it basically all comes down to control of hepcidin. That was my question as well, so that's good. Um, I think we'll go for the final question, and this comes from TGR Racing. 
They want to know, is modulating the intake of iron-rich foods sufficient to change infection responses? Yeah, so that is exactly what we're working on. Where So it, it may be. Um, I think you'd, you'd probably have to have quite a lot of iron-rich foods to influence it because it's hard to get a lot of iron in in that way. What we're hoping to do is something a bit similar, but to, mod to modulate hepcidin directly, and that controls the flow of iron in the body as well as the total amount of iron. Very often there already is enough iron in the body, it's just in the wrong place. And so by, by targeting hepcidin, it's possible to alter the flow and make it available to T cells. Great, thanks very much for joining us again this evening, Hal. Um, yeah, so before we move on, I just want to let everyone know that it, there's a link to a feedback form in the YouTube description below this video. And if you fill this in, you'll be entered into a prize draw with the chance to win some Pint of Science merchandise. So make sure you do that later. Okay, now our next speaker is Dr. Anna Mackin. Anna is an evolutionary anthropologist, writer, and broadcaster who studies the science behind our closest relationships. She is the author of The Life of Dad, The Making of a Modern Father, and the upcoming Why We Love, The New Science Behind Our Closest Relationships. Anna has also been involved in a number of TV shows, including Married at First Sight and Meet the Humans. Tonight, she will talk about the fundamental human need for love. I've hosted Anna a couple of times before for Pint of Science, and I'm sure we're in for a really great talk. Anna, the stage is yours. Excellent, thank you very much. And it is wonderful to be back speaking to you all today. Yes, today I'm gonna to talk about the power of love. So our innate need for love at a very basic level of human existence. Now, my job is to try and answer the question, what is love? And I've spent over a decade doing it. And as an anthropologist, I try to answer that question at every single level of explanation. And I'm still trudging away at it. Um, but tonight I want to present you with a few of the answers to try and build an argument about the fact that actually we need to view love at a more fundamental needs-based level than, for example, as an emotion. So one of the question, answers to the question, what is love? is that it is about survival. At its most basic level, love evolved to prompt us to invest in our survival critical relationships. Because humans are arguably one of the most, if not the most cooperative species on this planet. We need to cooperate with each other to subsist. So to gain all the basic needs of survival, such as food, water, and shelter. We need to cooperate to learn. So if you think about the huge amount of knowledge that we need to take on board just to operate at a basic level in our complex social and technological world, it would not be a good idea to try and do that on a trial and error basis. So we learn from each other. It's known as social learning. And it might be that we learn from each other directly, or we might just simply access Google, which itself is a man-made fount of uh, knowledge. We also, very critically need to cooperate to raise our children. It is very truly the case that it takes a whole village to raise a human child. Human children are born incredibly dependent. They are known as secondarily altricial and they have a huge amount of development to do post birth. And indeed we have two life history stages, childhood and adolescence added to the usual three that most mammals have simply to enable our children to have the time to take on board all the knowledge and development that they need. And therefore we need each other to help us raise those children. And because of the fact that we all need this cooperative uh, basis to our lives and the fact that it's so essential to our survival, means that we all tend to have a social network which is really identical to uh, in a certain way to each other. Because we because it's so critical that we have these social relationships, we invest as much time as we possibly can and as much of our cognitive capacity in doing them as we can spare. And indeed, we will push to the very bone our budgets in terms of feeding, e uh, eating, resting and reproducing as long as we can keep that social time ticking over. And because of the fact that we will push ourselves to these budgetary limits, we all tend to have a similarly um, design social network. And indeed, we all tend to have a similar number of people in that social network. So the average number of people in your social network is 150. That's known as Dunbar's number. And it's been replicated in many different studies around the world. And we arrange those 150 people in a very distinctive way. If you imagine a dartboard with you at the center of the bullseye, those 150 people are arranged in set circles, which center 
on that particular bullseye. And each circle increases by a scalar of about three. So at the very core of that particular uh, bullseye uh, dartboard are the five closest people to you. That is known as your central support clique. And those are the people who you turn to at your emotionally most difficult times. If we move a little further away from you, we get to the sympathy group layer, and that's 15 people. That includes the five that are in your central support clique. And these really are your go-to people for a good night out. They mostly consist of your friends. There might be some, some members of your family there, maybe some siblings. Beyond that, we have the affinity group. That's 45 people. And then we reach the limit of the active social network at 150 but you do not apply your time to all these people equally. Your central support clique gets 40% of your attention and time. Your sympathy group, another 20%. So the rest of your, your, uh, your network, that's your, your affinity group and, and the, um, the active social network. So the other 135 people only get 40% of your time. So we have to cooperate and we do it in a very identifiable way. However, the problem with cooperating with each with people is that it's incredibly stressful. In an ideal world, we would probably actually exist on our little island all alone. Because you see, the thing is, people lie and they cheat and they steal. And we have to spend a lot of time and indeed a lot of our cognitive attention trying to spot who these people are so that we don't invest in relationships with them. We also have to exist in a hierarchy like many primates. And that means we spend a lot of time monitoring everybody else in the hierarchy to make sure they don't usurp our position. We have to compete for those, those life critical resources. And we also have to coordinate our day with each other. The problem with group living is you cannot necessarily wake up in the morning and decide what you're going to do that day. Sometimes you have to do what the rest of the group wants to do, which sometimes can be at quite a considerable risk and cost to you. And finally, we have to cooperate across the biological sexes. And this is arguably the most complex form of cooperation there is. And therefore, we spend a lot of time having to compute the reciprocity that occurs between us and the opposite sex. So what has evolution come up with to motivate us and then reward us to actually input into these survival critical relationships? It's come up with a cocktail of neurochemicals. And I'm just going to inter introduce you very briefly to them now. Some of them you will have heard of before, maybe in the context of bonding, sometimes in other contexts such as health. So they are oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin and beta endorphin. They're all involved in bonding uh, and they're all critical at different times of the relationship uh, timeline. So oxytocin and dopamine are particularly important at the start of a relationship uh, because oxytocin gives you the confidence. It lowers your inhibitions to starting new relationships by quietening your amygdala. And then dopamine rewards you for taking the time to invest in those relationships. Serotonin is involved in the obsessive element of love. So the fact that you are actually going to be as obsessed with the other half to actually coordinate your day with them, for example. And beta endorphin, which is your body's natural opiate, it's your body's natural painkiller, has been co-opted to underpin our long-term human relationships which sometimes can last for decades. So actually, when we ask the question, what is love? At another level of explanation, love is simply biological bribery. It's that set of neurochemicals that motivate us and then reward us to invest in our survival critical relationships. But the big question is, OK, love was about survival, definitely in the knife edge environment in which we evolved. We really did depend upon each other just to garner the basic uh, elements of life. But is it really the case today where we think we understand what's important to our survival? It's, it's accessing water and food. It's, it's maintaining a healthy diet and maintaining a healthy weight and exercising and not smoking, for example. Those are the things we need to do to ensure that we survive in this modern environment. But I've got two case studies here to explain to you why I believe that love is just a, as much about survival today as it always is. It's, it's always been at the basis of our life. The first of these is the concept of biobehavioral synchrony. Now, this was uh, a concept discovered by the Israeli neuroscientist uh, Ruth Feldman. Um, and she is really one of the pioneers of understanding the neuroscience of close human relationships and love. And she noticed, as I'm sure many of us have, that when two people are in love, when they are closely bonded, whether it's a, a romantic couple or maybe a child and their parent, when we observe them, they have a sort of behavioural synchrony. It's that, that give and take of a reciprocal relationship. And they might even, for example, mimic each other's gestures or copy each other's vocal tics or, or choices of words. 
And she was interested that this seemed to be something that came up again and again in closely bonded relationships. So she decided to see whether this behavioural synchrony was underpinned by a physiological synchrony. So were there other mechanisms in the body underpinning this behavioural synchrony? So she looked at close couples and she studied their heart rate and their body temperature and their blood pressure. And she found that, again, when they were interacting together and exhibiting behavioural synchrony, these physiological measures also came into synchrony. So she took it one step further and she looked into the brain. And she explored whether neurochemistry came into synchrony and neural activity came into synchrony. And again, she also found that this was the case. So she studied oxytocin, mainly because this is the most easy uh, neurochemical for us to access. The others don't necessarily cross the blood brain barrier. And she found that, yes, people who entered the room with different baseline levels of oxytocin, we all exist at different baseline levels. After a period of interaction, their baseline levels had come into synchrony. And then if she looked at the gamma waves, which were being emitted by the higher cognitive processes of the brain, she again found that these came into synchrony. And I very, very strongly believe that biobehavioural synchrony, the concept of it, really underpins how incredibly important love is in our lives. Because love is so fundamental to your survival that evolution has seen fit to engage every mechanism in your body to ensure your survival critical relationships are as closely bonded as possible. So that's my first piece of evidence to explain why love is a fundamental and essential part of your life and of your survival. The second example is linked to the impact that your close relationships have upon your mental and physical health. Now, a, a groundbreaking study, a meta-analysis was carried out by Julian holt Lundstad in 2010. And she took 148 different studies looking at rates of mortality in chronic illness. And she looked at things like cardiovascular disease, renal failure and cancer. So she looked at both rates of mortality. She looked at longevity and she also looked at recovery from interventions uh, in these particular chronic illnesses. And she looked at those and then looked at the relationship between those uh, particular variables and aspects of the individual social network. And these were aspects such as just the fundamental size of the social network, the degree to into which they were embedded into that social network, their perception of how uh, integrated they were and how much social uh, help was available in the network and things like um, how much they volunteered within the community. She also assessed things like their, their self-perception of, of loneliness. And what she found was that by being in a healthy uh, social network, being well embedded within it, strong reciprocal relationships, that this reduced the risk of mortality from these cardiovascular diseases, renal failure and cancer by 50%. Now that puts it on a par with quitting smoking and it makes it more important as, as a variable, as an input into reducing rates of mortality than, for example, maintaining a healthy BMI. Now this was a ground pace, uh, breaking piece of work and astonishing in showing us how incredibly important our social relationships are. It has since been replicated. It was replicated by a Harvard group in 2019 who again found uh, effects upon mortality, on longevity and on simple health and mental health measures of around 50%. So the question arises, what is it about our social networks, about the relationships that we build with each other that mean that our social relationships can have such a powerful impact upon our mental and physical health. It could partly be because by being in a network, we are, for example, open to receiving help in financial, maybe if we're in financial difficulty or if we require practical help from somebody, they're there to care for us maybe after we've had an operation. It could be that health information moves swiftly through a well-embedded social network. It could be, for example, that by being in social networks, we know that by releasing that set of neurochemicals that I introduced you to at the start of the uh, talk, we lead to a, a, a decrease in cortisol, the stress hormone, which means that our immune systems are more reactive when we have infections. And it could tantalizingly be that the neurochemicals themselves have a role in stimulating our immune systems. In a set of work carried out um, in the early 2000s, it was found that that the beta endorphin in particular stimulated the killer cells in the immune systems of rats. Now, 
this hasn't been carried out on humans. It was a knockout study, which makes it a little bit tricky uh, to carry out in humans, but it gives us the tantalizing possibility that the neurochemicals that re are released when we interact with each other, in fact, stimulate our, um, our immune systems themselves. So, so far we found out the what is love, it's survival, it's biological bribery, and it's fundamental to our good mental and physical health. But is it an emotion? If we talk about love, we often talk about it and place it in the box alongside the other primary emotions, such as lust, anger, disgust, happiness. However, um, fitting love into that particular box is a little bit tricky. It's, it's too nebulous a concept. It's too large a concept concept to be restrained in that particular box. For example, one of the definitions of emotions is they are generally quite short-lived. However, love is something that can endure for many decades. Now, we might not constantly feel like we are passionately in love with somebody, but were we to stop a, a closely bonded couple in the street and say, are you in love? Do you love each other? The answer would probably be yes. Rather, love is more maybe a motivator, a motivator that makes us carry out behaviours which return our body to homeostasis. And one really interesting representation of love was actually discovered a very long time ago in the 1940s by Abraham Maslow in his Pyramid of Needs. And what he was trying to identify were those elements of human life which were either physiologically necessary or psychologically necessary to, for example, live a healthy and fulfilled life. So if we look at his pyramid of needs here on the screen, we can see at the very basic at his bottom tier, he has his physio physiological needs. These are fundamental to survival and they are food, water, warmth and rest. Without these, we are unlikely to survive. On top of that, we have our safety needs. So security and safety. Beyond that, we have our psychological needs. And though, and this is where Maslow places love. So the intimate relationships, our friendships, our belongingness within a social network and our love. And above there, we have other needs related to psychological states, such as esteem and self-actualization. Now, Maslow was certainly onto something here that rather than being an emotion, love is a fundamental human need. But I would argue that it's more fundamental than even Maslow conceived of in his model. I would argue it's right down there with those physiological needs of food, water, warmth and rest. Because without love, even at the most fundamental level, we do not get our food, our water, our warmth or our rest. We do not get the cooperation and the input from our fellow humans. Babies, which are born incredibly dependent, do not survive without love in their lives. And we know that children, for example, who have lived in uh, relationships with their carers, which have been neglectful or in, or not based, for example, on secure attachments, it causes actual physiological and developmental harm. And therefore, my argument is that love is a fundamental need. The cravings that we feel when we are away from, from our love are like thirst or like hunger. They drive us to be reconnected with the, with the focus of our love. They motivate us to seek out love in our lives and ensure that we have the love we require to underpin our health and our happiness and our life satisfaction. So love, I would argue, is a need, as essential to us as the food we eat, the water we drink and the air we breathe. We've seen from biobehavioural synchrony that it infiltrates every fibre of our being. It is so important to us that evolution has seen fit to engage every mechanism in our body to make sure that we are as close to the people we need as we possibly can be. So I would argue that love is an essential element of life. I'd like to thank you for listening. It's been a bit of a whiz to the idea of love. If you're interested in the research that's carried out on love, both by me and by my colleagues, um, please follow me on Twitter or go to my website. Also, maybe pop to YouTube where a Pint of Science supported 16-part uh, YouTube series that we, we filmed uh, early last year, just before COVID hit, um, How Love Makes Us Human. And that takes you through everything we now know about love and indeed a much more complex answer to the question, what is love? Thank you very much. Thanks, Anna. That was all, uh, interesting as always. So I'll quickly start with my own question and then we'll move on to some from the audience. So I want to know what's the difference between um, romantic love and parental love or love from your friends in terms of like the chemicals and everything. Is there any clear defined difference? 
there's no clear defined difference in terms of the chemicals. So that set of chemicals that I introduced at the beginning underpins all human interaction. It's just degrees of release. Um, what the differences between the different sorts of love are mainly within brain activation. So we see different activations in different areas of the brain. So for all types of love, we do see activation in the very core of the, of the brain in relation to nurture. And we see activation in the dop dopamine circuits related to reward. We also see a lot of activity in the prefrontal cortex because that's where your social cognition sits. However, obviously when we're looking at different sorts of love, if we're looking at um, parenting love, we get a lot of activation in the area of the brain known as the PAG, which again underpins parenting behaviors and nurturing. Whereas we see a lot in the hypothalamus in relation to romantic love because obviously it's got that sexual element. Friendship love is a little bit more tricky. There's not a lot of research left let, yet on the um, brain activations that occur in friendship love, but it's probably more akin to something between probably romantic and parental love. And obviously, unless you're friends with benefits, we're not expecting to see much in the hypothalamus. Thank you. Right, we'll go on to some audience questions now, I think. So Dave, David Granger wants to know, to what extent do animals feel love? And more specifically, does my guinea pig really love me or am I just projecting? <laughs> this is a really, really important area. And what gets me quite cross about it is we actually hold animal love to higher levels of evidence than human love. So if I said to you, David, do you love your guinea pig? And you said, yes, I would believe you. OK, but if we said, does your guinea pig love? We expect barrel loads of evidence to show it. So there are, there are lots of different things we would expect um, love to meet in terms of to say okay this type of love is on a par with human love so we'd expect to see an attachment well guinea pigs do build attachments okay they build it to their offspring they build it to their partners we would expect to see some form of empathy now really to have human love you have to have cognitive empathy i'm not sure guinea pigs have that but they probably have emotional empathy okay we would expect to see um relationships outside of the reproductive relationships so can guinea pigs build friendships I'm not quite sure, but maybe you feel you've got a friendship with your guinea pig. So animal love is really complex. I, I would say, yes, a lot of animals do f have love relationships. Certainly, I would say the higher primates do. Certainly, if you're looking at dolphins, they do. And certainly dogs do. There's been an amazing uh, fMRI study done recently um, on dog love. And we see all the activations in the brain that we're expecting to see if an animal feels love. Whether or not your guinea pig does, I'm not sure anybody's done anything on that. And I can see, and can you artificially induce love in guinea pigs? You can certainly try to induce lovely warm feelings. So definitely cuddling, I'm sure would release an oxytocin rush for both of you, which definitely for a guinea pig probably feels like love. Great, so that also goes with another question from someone else that was asking, is it possible to artificially induce the feeling of love? So I guess that's a similar. Yeah, in answer. humans, obviously you've got, you've got slightly more tools in your box as compared to a guinea pig. So because beta endorphin underpins human love, it doesn't underpin guinea pig love, I imagine. Um, and it's an opiate. There's lots of different behaviors you can do to induce that. So exercising with the person you love, touching them, laughing with them. I always say to people, if you really want someone to fall in love with you, go ballroom dancing with them if you've never done it before. Because first of all, you'll laugh a lot, that releases beta endorphin. You'll be touching each other, that, that releases beta endorphin. And you'll be doing something new and that releases lots of adrenaline and lots of lovely new um, neurochemicals that underpin novelty. So there are ways that you can increase the likelihood that someone will fall in love with you, but we can't guarantee it, I'm afraid. Thanks. So, um, G U G wants to know if love is about survival. What about cases when it reduces your survival chances? E.g., grieving for dead mates yeah. instead of new ones. Unfortunately, grief is really the price you pay for having love in your life. Grief, grief is survival threatening. It is, from an evolutionary point of view, maladaptive. But grief is the result of having been deeply in love. So, first of all, you've got the withdrawal of neurochemicals, which gives you. A, particularly an opiate withdrawal, which is incredibly painful. It's the same as heroin withdrawal. And you've also got a psychological and emotional withdrawal, which is incredibly painful. So I'm afraid, no, grief is not adaptive. I'm afraid it's, it's there because you've had love. Um, and you will find, even again, in the higher primates, you will find, um, for example, mothers of, of, of apes that have died who will sit by the body and not feed themselves because they are in such grief. So I'm afraid, yes, grief is the price. Okay, a question coming from Rama Ahuja. Do you think robots could ever feel feel love like humans do? 
oh this is a really controversial one um and in fact like if you watch the youtube thing there's a whole program on this um love is incredibly complex human love is incredibly complex and the basis of of human love is empathy empathy is a higher cognitive ability many animals have empathy um whether or not you could program a robot to have it is difficult it's very hard to see how a robot would experience love the way we do without a wet brain because it would not have all the neurochemicals it would not be able to induce biobehavioral synchrony which really is the fundamental foundation of human love so i would say no but if you got a roboticist on here they'd probably answer differently <laughs> Okay, we'll try and squeeze in two more, I think. So we've got one from Phil Bell Young. Um, got a list of questions that apparently are scientifically proven to make you fall in love with someone on a date. Is this real or science fiction? Okay, it's a real study. It was carried out by Arthur Aron in 1997 and it's a set of questions, but I'm afraid the original study wasn't intended to make you fall in love. It was intended to make you feel closer to a stranger. Unfortunately, over time, as it's been reported, particularly in the press, it's been mislabeled as being a way to make you fall in love it won't make you fall in love but it will genuinely probably make you feel closer to somebody because one of the things that makes you feel close to people is sharing uh is is no is being very vulnerable and actually the list of questions really asks you to reflect on your deepest darkest thoughts and feelings and reveal yourself to the other person that certainly is a way of inducing feeling closer to someone but i doubt it would make you fall in love Sorry. Interesting. <laughs> um, right, the final question, I think, is coming from Keep Calm and Be. What's the difference between cognitive and emotional love? Well, they're both really important in human love. We're very lucky we get to experience both at the same time. Emotional love sits in your limbic area of your brain, at the core of your brain, very unconscious area of your brain, very ancient. That's where emotional love sits and it's unconscious. Cognitive love is your higher, is your neocortex and cortex. So particularly your prefrontal cortex is where cognitive love sits. And that's where you can reflect upon your love. You can trust, you can empathize, you can decide to you know, invest in your relationship, whatever it might be. So we, that's the difference. One of them is conscious, one of them is unconscious. One of them is much more of, a, of an instinctive driver. That's emotional love. That's where attraction sits, by the way. Attraction at the very instant that you see somebody is, is unconscious. Whereas cognitive uh, love is much more higher order. But we're really lucky. We get to experience both. And there's a really lovely neural connection between the two so that you get that whole round love experience. Great. Thanks again for the really uh, interesting talk, Anna. And reminder for everyone to fill in the feedback form below this video for a chance to win some Pint of Science merchandise. So the last thing that remains for me to do is to thank you all for joining us at Oxford Pint of Science team this evening and for your interesting questions. This event would not have been possible without the help of my amazing team backstage, including Sandy Chu, Emma Haberman, Lisa Lenhus and Gerardo Montalvo. We hope to see you all again soon at some future Pint of Science events.